Mesdames et Messieurs, je suis très contente de vous retrouver aujourd'hui, cet après-midi, pour accueillir un invité de Marc, le professeur Marc Zetoun. Le professeur Zetoun est aussi une personne remarquable qui, fait, qui conduit à la fois des activités pratiques et théoriques. Il est directeur du Geneva Water Hub qui est un centre d'expertise basé à Genève et qui travaille avec différentes composantes dans le monde entier. Le professeur Zetoun a été aussi, dans son aspect pratique, a été impliqué dans de nombreuses négociations, soutien de négociations au Moyen-Orient et en Afrique. Il a des recherches qui aussi portent sur les conflits et la coopération pour les eaux internationales transfrontières. Il est professeur en même temps qu'en faisant toutes ses activités à l'université d'East Anglia et consultant pour de nombreuses organisations internationales. Il est de formation ingénieur de l'université de McGill, de Montréal, et il est aussi une formation de géographie humaine au King's College de Londres. Il est l'auteur d'un grand nombre de publications. Je voudrais signaler la parution imminente, si elle n'est pas déjà parue, d'un livre de réflexion de Marc Zetoun sur le rapport que nous avons avec l'eau. C'est un livre qui est une source d'inspiration et qui stimule beaucoup la réflexion sur la manière dont nous gérons notre relation à l'eau et de ce que nous acceptons euh, du traitement qui est réservé à la ressource en eau. Je vous euh, sollicite dans votre intérêt et de regarder ce livre qui, va, et qui est paru chez Oxford University Press. Aujourd'hui, Marc Zetoun va nous parler, va évoquer la question de ce qu'on peut appeler l'hydrodiplomatie, c'est les questions de relation, euh, de la place de la diplomatie dans l'eau, ce matin, j'ai parlé du règlement des différents, mais avant de parler de différents, euh, il est très important que l'on puisse négocier des accords qui puissent satisfaire tous les intérêts en présence. Il y a différentes techniques pour cela et euh, nous allons pouvoir bénéficier de la grande expérience du professeur Zetoun sur cette question. Je vais lui donner la parole et ensuite nous aurons euh, un échange avec lui. Je vous remercie. Étant un bon Canadien, je vous demande euh, d'abord votre permission de continuer en anglais. Thanks. It'll be much easier for me. Uh, so, I'm the Director General of the Geneva Water Hub, and the Geneva Water Hub has as its mission to mainstream water for peace into humanitarian development and peace building worlds. You can ask us what peace is, and that's a really good question we should have an answer for. And peace is the absence of conflict, but it's much more than that too. It's peace is justice, and peace is an environment where everyone can flourish. This is what our mission at the Geneva Water Hub is. One way to get to peace, we believe, is through water diplomacy. And that's what we'll be talking to you about today. So, I'll try to convince you that water diplomacy has great potential to transform things, but also some limits. That water diplomacy should address inequalities, and that water diplomacy can manage conflicts, but can do a lot more than that if we, if we try hard enough. <clears throat> but first, we'll talk about some theory, so that before we look at some cases. So water as a political resource, water and conflict, and then water diplomacy before we look at three cases in very rapid fire, the Nile, the Tigris and Euphrates, and the Jordan rivers. So I say water is a political resource. And here I'm being provocative to my former engineering friends that water is not a technical resource. It's not a biophysical resource. It's a political resource. And of course, it's, it's everything, but we have to understand the politics of water uh, clearly. Because if we're wondering why this farmer lost all their input, uh, all their money when they farmed this time, because there wasn't enough rain, you could blame climate change. You could blame weather patterns. Uh, the rains didn't come. There was a drought. There wasn't enough water. Or maybe there was too much demand. But there certainly wasn't enough water. 
Is this the same form of water scarcity what these kids are suffering? Here they're actually standing on top of a water, the water pipe that takes water to your hotel when you're in Mumbai. So there's a lot of water, good quality water too, but these kids will never drink a drop of it. So that's a totally different type of scarcity. It's, it's, we would call that not biophysical scarcity, but social water scarcity or economic scarcity. And that shows you that just how good we are at discriminating, at using water to discriminate for people, along, usually along how much money they can pay. The, pay, all, the poor always pay the most for water everywhere I've been. Or depending on their caste, or their religion, or sometimes their nationality. <clears throat> so you have to look at, if you want to understand water conflicts, it makes no, no sense whatsoever to look just at the physical side. You also have to look at the social side of things. And so understanding water conflicts is constantly navigating between these biophysical and social lenses. And one important takeaway from this is do not blame God or Mother Nature or climate change. That's a common thing these days, right? We blame climate change for everything, as if it was a surprise, as if we haven't already adapted to it, as if we haven't put uh, hundreds or thousands of fields into agri intensive agricultural production and created a need where there wasn't one before. And so, Yes, climate change is complicating things, absolutely. But I wouldn't blame climate change. And if we, uh, we can get closer to whatever truth is by looking at hard and social science. Now, a little bit more, a little bit more theory about water and conflict. So water and conflict, as Frank Galland will tell you, is, can be seen in many ways. Water can be a tool of conflict, it can be a victim of conflict, or it can be a source of conflict. And I wish I had six hours with you because then I could talk about all three elements. But we'll talk just about the water as a source of conflict and focus mainly on rivers. Of course, water is not just rivers, but consider Central Asia, former Soviet Union. Where rivers, whether the states like it or not, are tied together by, the states are tied together by rivers. Rivers cross borders, just as clouds cross borders, just as aquifers underground cross borders. And so states are forced to interact whether they like it or not. And the idea of full territorial sovereignty over a, a resource that crosses a border is absurd. And yet it's an idea that we hold very tightly. Most states, <clears throat> most people and most state representatives hold very firmly to the idea of full territorial sovereignty. Doesn't work with water. It can't work with water. You can't control water that much unless you stop it all, which is possible and does happen. Especially through dams. And dams are wonderful. They give us, in some ways, they're wonderful. Uh, they produce a lot of hydro, a lot of electricity. They can make great reservoirs and regulate rivers so that it's easier to grow lots of food. But of course, uh, almost inevitably, they end up displacing lots of people who had no say in the matter, who didn't choose to leave. Uh, and they have enormous uh, environmental impact. They change the temperature of the water, uh, the oxygen levels in the water, the flow of the water, and therefore the whole ecosystem is, is permanently changed. And they create effects downstream. So when upstream states develop, they have downstream impacts. There's this idea of late developing upstream states. Usually, if you know the history of civilization, most civilizations started on the banks of gentle rivers, where the, the, the water was secure. And most of these places when they became states and with the technological turn in the 1920s became, uh, started building dams uh, and, and indeed developed well ahead of all the other, of the upstream states. Now, 1950s, 60s, 70s, up until 2020, 2030, it's the upstream states mostly that are developing. 
So downstream states have built their dams and the effects were only upon their own people. And sometimes it was devastating. But now when upstream states develop, then uh, it has a downstream effect that can't be ignored. And this is what international water law recon tries to reconcile through the principle of equitable and reasonable utilization and the legal entitlement to no significant harm. So states are forced together, dams are built, uh, there's downstream impact of upstream development, there's tension. <laughs> and that tension between states can be because of pollution, the quality of the water, or the quantity of the water. And I think as Jimena Fuentes would have pointed out that you cannot separate a water conflict from all the other conflicts that are going on between these states or these peoples. Certainly not in Iraq and Iran, for example. There's more than just water that is at stake there, a lot more. And so water is always part of a larger political and social uh, landscape, which all of which has to be considered if you're going to be serious about reducing the tensions. And if you can reduce the tensions, then the, the transformation, what you can achieve is enormous. Because if the states are actually coordinating the use of water, then you can put all sorts of fields under, under production. You might be able to distribute <coughs> that food equitably. Uh, you can develop this to the same level that uh, Nor Norway has developed in terms of dams in Northern Europe, and even within Western Europe. I mean, in the last 50 years, since we haven't been trying to eliminate each other. This has enormous potential. So if we get it right, uh, the, the, the potential benefits are huge. And this is what water diplomacy should be getting at. So now, from an analytical point of view, it's not so simple to compare the, the cases that we're going to look at, say, with uh, the EU in 2020. 2022, where there's a pretense of equality, and for all intents and purposes, you know, all states have roughly the same amount of influence over uh, decisions made about their waters through the EU mechanism. That's easy to work with. It's easy, even if it takes months and years, to sort things out on the Rhine or the Rhone River. Uh, and, but in situations of hegemony, where there's formal equality, states are formally equal, but obviously not equal, like at the UN. I mean, no one will say that the Comoros Islands and the USA have equal power, but they both have one vote at the UN General Assembly. Formal equality, but actual power asymmetry, that's the, the tougher neighborhoods that we're working in. And in those neighborhoods, we can, what we've done, mostly through, thanks to Tony Allen, and his group of PhD students at the London Water Research Group, looking at how control over the flows has been consolidated through two strategies, either resource capture or containment, and then all sorts of tactics, like sometimes military force, active stalling on negotiations, constructing knowledge, sanctioning the discourse, all these ideas that have been inspired well, if you theorize it, it, there are different forms of power. In Joseph Nye's uh, simple explanation, hard and soft power. And power theory, of course, no stranger to these halls. Uh, beautiful thinkers like Antonio Gramsci, Franz Fanon, Aimé Césaire, Edward Said, and Lux, wonderful thinkers that all that theory about power can be applied to transboundary water conflicts but at least thinking about it in terms of hard and soft power, realizing that mostly in transboundary water conflicts, it's, it's soft power that is more important. It's not about wars and tanks and F-16s or F-35s. It's about putting in the minds of people that the situation is normal, that this is the only way, that there's no alternative, so that you come to accept inequalities. You say, oh, well, yeah, there's a 90%, 10% split on this river, but climate change is making it worse, so let's not talk about uh, rights, let's talk about uh, technology instead. And there are all sorts of narrat the narratives that accompany these excuses. You know, we, 
let's not talk about rights or let's uh, they are to blame because they built this dam. Those narratives can go deep into the minds of the diplomatic community, especially if the diplomatic, I'm thinking about third party mediators and diplomats who are sent out by their capital, who already have a lot of political luggage vis-a-vis -vis these states that they're intervening with, they will tend to go with the narrative that suits their work more easily. It's called sanctioning the discourse or the narrative. And so lots of potential solutions are not observed because they also don't fit into the narrative and into these ideas that have been constructed. I'm saying this based on my experience of the Nile, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Now, power asymmetries are, are of course a fact of life. The question is for a basin hegemon, so a river basin hegemon, the most powerful country between formal equals, can choose to dominate and hoard all the water, or that the hegemon can choose to lead and share all the water. In a way, that's up to them. And in, for this lecture, I'm focusing on third party me mediators. The question is, what do you as a diplomat do? How would you intervene in Central Asia? What tools would you use? And this is where we come to water diplomacy. So I found that there's two general approaches to water diplomacy. One is that you ignore the issues and you ignore the influence that soft power is having over you. And then that's basically conflict management. You can manage the conflict. You can make sure it doesn't go violent. You have a bunch of options at this point. You can talk about sharing benefits instead of sharing the water. So the electricity that's produced, the food that's produced in one state, say upstream, where it makes more sense to have a dam from a hydrological perspective or hydraulic perspective, you can share those benefits uh, rather than sharing the water itself. You can link issues, which is a classic negotiation strategy or tactic, uh, linking water issues, like trading water for other on trade-offs and other political interests that the states have between themselves. And you can use your checkbook or technology. I mean, you can get a state to agree to uh, a certain arrangement if uh, by giving it enough money or by building infrastructure, desalination plants or a friendship dam or something like that. You have all these options at your disposal. The other approach is to look for and address these inequalities and these debilitating narratives and, these, and look for alternative solutions. And here, you could be trying to resolve the conflict or transform the conflict. There's interesting debates, I'm sure you're aware of, uh, about the relative benefits of uh, trying to resolve a conflict versus transforming a conflict. I I lean towards transforming conflicts because I don't think any conflict of this complexity could ever be resolved. And it's naive to think that it could be permanently resolved. Any change in an arrangement over waters is going to upset some people. And there will always be a little bit of conflict there, if not a lot of conflict. But you can transform the situation from one that's wholly inequitable into one that's sort of equitable. That's a bit more pragmatic and, and probably more realistic. And there, so you look for, as a diplomat, you look for the alternative solutions, the, the voices on the margins, the less common narratives. And you, you question the narratives, the, the, you look for the common, less, the alternative solutions, and you question the narratives that you're hearing from the dominant sources. And here, you have a few more, method, few more methods at your disposal. You can try to level the players by building capacity, for example. So the classic example of this is when the different European countries supported the Palestinian side in their negotiations with Israel, not just in water, but in all issues. That was with an understanding that uh, an agreement reached between uh, parties of roughly equal power is more sustainable than an agreement reached between parties of very different power because of coercion that's likely to happen at the negotiations table. So you can level the playing field by you know, investing in international lawyers 
or negotiators or skills building or st strategy development. Or you can begin to level the playing field. And this is where I would say international water law has a role to play. International water law, which Professor Laurence has talked about at length, in my opinion, is uh, the best guide to, for negotiations. In directly confronting and tackling head on this upstream downstream dynamic and giving a legal entitlement for an upstream state to develop, recognizing that states are going to develop and they have a legal entitlement to do like the downstream states. But somehow reconciling that with the legal entitlement of downstream states not to have, not to experience significant harm. And the, mostly this is done through that mechanism of equitable and reasonable use in the UN Water Courses Convention. Uh, which has, you know, seven or eight categories of how do you define what uh, equitable and eas reasonable uses based on how much rain or rain falls on the country or how much water is in the country, how much the people are dependent on it, access to other sources, etc. For me, as an engineer, it's, it's, it's pretty well thought through. Of course, they didn't mention what, when you talk about no significant harm, the lawyers didn't specify what significant is. But if you're ready to pay a thousand pounds an hour for them, then they'll give you an interpretation of significant. But that's left open. But the good news is if you're trying to transform the conflict, you have, you can level the players, you can level the playing field, and you still have these other more pragmatic options of sharing benefits or linking issues or throwing technology at it. Okay, so let's look at a few cases. The Nile River. You know the Nile, I suppose. Oh, sorry. It starts the White Nile in Lake Victoria, which is a funny name for a lake in the middle of Africa, but there you go. And it's joined by the Blue Nile, which falls off of Lake Tana in Addis in Ethiopia to join at Khartoum, and then flow northwards. It flows downhill, not uphill, but northwards. And so if you measure the flow of the river at this point, at the border of Egypt and uh, Sudan, roughly 80% of it falls as rain in Ethiopia. So in a way, if you look at it from you know, a, a narrow, territorial or political boundary perspective, most Ethiopia contributes most of the water to the Nile. And all these other countries contribute a lot of water. I mean, it's the longest river in the world. Uh, there's a lot of water, but it's only 20% of, of the water measured at this, at this point. Now, the only treaty that's signed on the Nile River is a post-colonial treaty on the back of the 1929 colonial treaty, which was signed between Egypt and Sudan, which gave, they didn't give percentages, it gives absolute volumes, but that which work out to about 85% of the flow of the Nile for Egypt and about 15% for Sudan. Which means, according to that treaty anyway, Sudan, South Sudan, which didn't exist at the time, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, and the DR Congo have exactly the right to 0%. Now, it didn't say that, of course, and I'm putting it far too simplistic, but those states weren't involved in that treaty. And all the water is tied up in, according to the Treaty of 1959. What would a legal distribution look like? Well, the equitable and reasonable principle takes into account how much water each country has. And in Egypt, it doesn't rain, basically. It's, a, it's the desert. It gets about 50 millimeters of water per year. And millions of farmers, farming families are dependent on it. Hundreds of thousands of farming families are dependent on it for agriculture, for their livelihoods. So, not a lot of water in Egypt and quite a bit of need in Egypt would suggest that Egypt is due a much bigger share of the Nile than, say, uh, the DR Congo. 
which is a rainforest, and, which, and also of which very little of its territory is in the Nile Basin. And so e Egypt has a, certainly has a great need. But Ethiopia is now, of course, you've heard, is building this dam, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which follows dams like the Meroe Dam in Sudan, which Sudan has built, or the Aswan High Dam here, which had flooded out Nubian territory on both sides of the border in Egypt and Sudan. So there's a long history of uh, cooperation over this river, led by uh, the, 19, sorry, the, the Nile Basin Initiative, many, many different donors and actors, who for 20 or 30 years got the states to cooperate to study, to learn about the evapotranspiration rates in all the fields, threw a lot of science at it, and also developed a legal framework along, alongside of it. But there was a big revolution in Egypt in 2011. Uh, six months after that, the announcement of the construction of the GERD was made. So, no, actually two months after the, the, the fall of uh, Hosni Mubarak, that the, cons the announcement of the construction of the GERD was made. They're not directly linked, it's not that simple, but it's amazing coincidence. And since that time, there's been a lot of back and forth diplomacy, uh, and, and it's heated up actually. To, to the point that in 2015, Ethio Ethiopia led on negotiations uh, between the three countries and developed a, the Declaration of Principles between the three countries, which was informed by some of the legal work that had been done through the NBI. The NBI fell apart uh, precisely because the, uh, it, it wasn't converted in 2010. Sorry, yeah, there, another important part, part of this puzzle is that in 2010, before the, the political revolution in Egypt, the Nile Basin Initiative fell apart in the sense that uh, it was not able to turn, uh, to agree the cooperative framework agreement because uh, Egypt and uh, Sudan were opposed to a, one clause in the cooperative framework agreement, which was about water security, which suggested that the water uh, shares of the, the Nile River might be in, in question. So it's a very sensitive issue. The mediators in the, part, in the negotiations or in the, in the talks at the NBI more or less told the other states to agree with the Egyptian position and expected the other countries to, to follow their counsel. But they didn't. Ethiopia led a block of countries that stopped that, that made it so that the cooperative framework was actually agreed despite Egypt and Sudan, Sudanese concerns. And though everything more or less fell apart, Ethiopia began to lead on the negotiations. The Americans got involved uh, with the Donald Trump presidency in 2019 and threatened or suggested that maybe Egypt could threaten or bomb Addis Ababa, somehow implying uh, that violence was the way forward. And here we are in 2023, 2023, and the war of words continues. It's extremely tense along the Nile River. But it, there is a war of words, and at least they're talking, mostly. Not as much as they should be, not as much as they could be as they are in other parts of the world. Uh, but, the, but looking at the methods, the diplomatic goal and the result, then all of these methods were actually used, including capacity building and international law. But generally, the mediators chose to try to manage the conflict rather than address the key issue, which was all about the shares of water, of the fresh water. Because you could also count green water, the soil water, that exists in the highlands of Ethiopia and Kenya. And so the conflict keeps boiling on. We could also look at the Jordan River. So here, this is the river that flows southwards to the Dead Sea, the lowest body of water on the planet at about minus 400 meters and, and dropping all the time. 
starts in Lebanon and in the occupied Golan Heights and in Israel, flows through the Lake of Tiberias or Lake Kinneret or the Sea of Galilee and then into the Dead Sea. And you've got the five political entities, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel and Palestine or occupied West Bank and Gaza. You've got the river, which really doesn't have a lot of water in it anymore. And then you've got all these aquifers, that all of which are transboundary. And here you've got, uh, at least looking at the, the agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis, you've got, uh, the, as part of the 1995 Oslo, Oslo II agreement, the accord gave roughly 80% of, of the flows of the groundwater to Israel and roughly 20% to the Palestinians. And if you include the surface water, the Jordan River in it, it works out to about 90%, 10%. Of course, this was supposed to be a temporary solution. It was supposed to be renegotiated in 2000. It was, uh, it was never renegotiated. Uh, and so it stands to this day that one drop in every 10 that falls in the region is available for Palestinians. So it's highly asymmetric again. Of course, you can't separate water from the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. 1948, the creation of the State of Israel, Israel Nekba, the 1967 occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, which many would argue is still ongoing, despite attempts to make Palestine a state. And, and yet, this agreement, the, the terms of the water agreement are still stuck to by this 1995 also two agreement. There's been very little progress, no movement basically since 1995. And that's again, despite a lot of uh, diplomacy thrown at the situation. So technical diplomacy, again, quantifying, it's the best studied river system and aquifers system in the world. Lots of science thrown at it, uh, multilateral working groups between everyone and the creation of a joint water committee between Palestinians and Israelis that uh, was held up as a model for other states to turn, you know, to turn their swords into plowshares and to begin to cooperate and go and measure groundwater tables together and then eat hummus afterwards together and, and enjoy it. Things have gone very much sour through those political relations in the hopeful days of 1995. Jan Selby would say that, would explain that the very coercive mechanism that exists in the Joint Water Committee, mainly having jurisdiction only in the West Bank and not in Israel, allows Israel to uh, oblige the Palestinian government to accept Israeli settlement water projects. So allowing basically the colonization of the West Bank and Gaza. So the Palestinians are consenting to their own colonization through this joint water committee. That's what Selby argues and everything I've seen on the ground suggests as much. And so it's not a model I would try to emulate in other places because it's just creating more and more tension. The, not, the narrative here, and I should say that I was advising the Palestinian side on their negotiations strategies with Israel uh, between 2003 and 2010, which included one official round of negotiations, the Annapolis round, George Bush Jr., just before he left office. Uh, so the narrative that we heard all the time when the Palestinians were trying to develop their negotiation strategy on the back of international water law was, oh, don't talk about law, don't talk about rights, let's talk about your needs, let's talk about desalination. Let's desalinate on the coast and give you water. And, and we don't have to share the water equitably. That was in 2003, 2004, and it's, it's, it carried on. And now the climate change narrative has come on top of it. It says, oh, there's not enough water for everyone anyway, so let's just uh, desalinate yet more water. And desalination is a big component here, and I can elaborate more if you want during the questions. Uh, but basically nothing has changed, and the water conflict goes on, and the people suffering are the, the poorest families in the West Bank who are scrambling for water and sending their kids to the capitals because they can't farm anymore. 
so that there's no violence over it, so the conflict is properly managed. But how long can that last? And is it fair to have to, to force people to adapt anyway? So looking at the methods and classifying it according to the frame I set up, there's been absolutely no talk of international water law and the conflict is, is continuing to boil. Now last case, the Tigris and Euphrates, which has lots and lots of dams built on it. Iraq was the first to build dams. If you live down here in Basra, you know that dams upstream in Iraq, before any other dams were built, already affected the flow, such that the, the Arab or the Persian Gulf actually backs up into the supply of this fresh water because of dams that Iraq has built within Iraq. But there's since then been lots of dams built in Syria and certainly <coughs> many more dams built in Turkey and in Iran. To the point that, well, okay, so there was you know, 22 projects, dams built, and it's ongoing, this GAP project. Lots of river diversion projects in Iran, and not a lot of institutions. Only one agreement, formal agreement, the 1987 uh, Turkey-Syria agreement, which guaranteed to Syria 500 meters cubed per second over, on average, over a year. What would the legal distribution of water look like? It would probably look a lot like on the Nile, because in Iraq, in southern Iraq, it doesn't rain a lot. In northern Iraq, it rains quite a bit. You'd have to calculate that and how much the people need it and, and all these other factors. It would look a lot different than it is right now, because in Iraq, the country is, is really drying. The rivers are drying up. Iraq today is what Egypt fears to become. Egypt is really worried, Egyptians are worried about the effects of this dam upstream on them. But Iraq is already there, and yet we're not talking about it. There is no even war of words. There's very, very few meetings, there's very little going on, there's very little international diplomacy thrown at it. Turkey and Iraq are talking, and they're talking about technical cooperation. And the narrative is that Iraq is using water inefficiently and in Turkey, we use it efficiently, so it should be, it makes sense that uh, we, we get more of the supply of water, to put it, to characterize it like that. Now, and there's also a, a, a narrative that says, let's not, we don't need international water law. In any case, it's a European convention or, and an and intervention that we don't need here. We can just share water, uh, use water where it makes most sense and where it's most efficiently used. So it's not uh, in line with the principles of international water law and the consequences in Iraq are already huge. There are options that uh, are not being considered as far as I know. There's, for instance, there's a new dam being built or planned on the Jezera, the Jezera Dam right here, Beno downstream of the Elisu Dam, which could take lessons from Senegal or the Western Africa and the OMVS, the water body that includes four or five different countries in Western Africa where they actually co-designed the dam, co-financed it and share the benefits of it. So one possibility to get a better arrangement on the Tigris and Euphrates would be to have Iraq co-design this new dam that is being planned. Or to negotiate along the principles of international water law, equitable and reasonable use. And Iraq would have to do the same with Iran, which is a whole different political game, obviously, and not, not at all straightforward. What is the role of the international community here? Well, <laughs> they're not really involved. It's almost as if we're saying, what conflict? Anyone who goes to Iraq knows that it's the most important thing for Iraqis. But it's really not getting the attention that even the Nile is getting. And it's already much worse, and it can still get worse. So it deserves a lot more attention. So a bit of a disaster. I wish I had happier news for you. But those three cases, I think, reaffirm the conclusions I asserted at the, 
at the beginning that water diplomacy really does have enormous potential to transform things to improve it. But we have to address the inequalities. We can't ignore them. And let's not manage or delay the water conflicts, but let's transform them. So with that, I'd like to thank Professor Laurence for hosting me and for all of you for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>